Hi guys, so I'm going to read Silver Surfer number one. So the origin of the Silver Surfer. Now this isn't Silver Surfer's first appearance. His first appearance was in Fantastic Four number 58, I think. That was his first appearance. And I, I read I read up to, yeah, I read that one. His first, the Galactus Saga. That was one of the first videos I read. But the most e eagerly awaited epic of the year. The origin of the Silver Surfer. One of Comictum's greatest collaborations, proudly presented by Stan the Man Lee, John Blood and Guts Pashima, Embellishment Joe Sinnott, Lettering Sam Rosen. High over the roofs of the world he soars, free and unfettered as the roaring wind itself. Behold the sky born spanner of a trillion galaxies, the restless streaking stranger from the farthest reach of space, this glistening gleaming seeker of truth, who men shall call forevermore the Silver Surfer. And they call him the Streaking Stranger. I mean, he's a, he's tech, well, he's wearing underwear. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, he's a Streaking Stranger. He's, he's a streaker or whatever. But suddenly, unexpectedly, before the piercing, penetrating eyes of the speeding surfer, a blazing out of control capsule hurls out of orbit. I could sense a living human within that plummeting missile. A human who is in most grave danger, for he does not stir within his sunken metal shell, and his supply, his life's giving supply of oxygen, will soon be gone. I cannot per permit a fellow being to perish, while it is within my power to save him. To one who has endured the airless vacuums of the unending cosmos, it matters not whether I span the emptiness of space or the watery vastness of the undersea depths. A simple thrust of concentrated cosmic force will be sufficient to open the hatch I see before me. Fortunately, he still wears his protective helmet. It will sustain him until we can seek the sanctuary of the skyways. Then seconds later, aircraft, searching, probing the area. They are seeking him who I might found. Blue leader to back Black Boy Brigade. We found our missing mud hack. Veering sharply at 11 o'clock. He's been captured single-handed by the Silver Surfer. Contact floating den mother. They're heading to right towards her. A large armored vessel. That it must be here that he belongs. Look, the squadron was right. It's the Surfer. He's got Colonel Jameson. I don't get it. He's put him on the deck. He's leaving him there, and he's headed skyward again. Look after the colonel. We can lead the surfer to our jets. Owen says, hold your fire. We can't endanger the colonel. His life has been saved. Thus, I may now depart once more. Circle him. Force him down. It's beyond belief. They actually attack me. He's evading us. Let him have it. In every part of the globe, it's the same. Hatred, fear, and unreasoning hostility have possessed men's hearts. But the Silver Surfer will have no part in it. Do you see that? He increased his speed and zoomed over the horizon like a meteor. He must be halfway around the world by now. Blue leader to Mudhawks returned to the roost. Our pigeons flown the coop. Within seconds, almost every capital on Earth is visited by the silvery streaking surfboard and his skyborne master. But Commissar, he has penetrated our missile defenses as though it did not exist. We must act. We must do something. Of course, General, of course. We will remain calm and totally ignore the inc entire incident. He is heading towards Peiping. Or, is it, I mean Beijing? Oh, Beijing. He, he will, we shall now allow our cursed uh, comrades to deal with him. But the total power of the Red Chinese is equally ineffectual against the speeding surfer. I could destroy them with a single cosmic blast. But to what avail? It is an imperious p imperialist plot against the security of the People's Republic. Call out the Red Guard. We must print a million new posters with the sublime thoughts of Chairman Mao. Oh, shit. Sorry about that. So, but neither missiles nor meaningless mouthings of petty pedagogues can halt the progress of the Silver Surfer or stifle the longing of his tortured soul. In all the galaxies, in all the endless reaches of space, 
I have found no planet more blessed than this, no word more lavishly endowed with natural beauty, with gentle climate, with every ingredient to create a virtual living paradise. Possessed of rainfall in great abundance, soil fertile enough to feed a galaxy, and a sun ever warm, ever constant, ever symbolizing new life, new hope. It's as though the human race has been divinely favored over all who live, and yet, in their uncontrollable insanity, in their unforgiving, in unforgivable blindness, they seek to destroy this shining jewel, this softly spinning gem, this tiny blessed sphere, which men call Earth. While trapped upon this world of madness stand I, how much longer am I destined to endure a fate I cannot even comprehend? How much longer before my eyes may once again behold the wonders of the ever-changing cosmos? How much longer before my exile ends, and I may stand once more upon the land that gave me birth? Even now I can recall those early days, those youthful years, upon the planet Zen La. How well I remember the yearning, the questioning, the aching discontent which filled my heart, even then. Our race has achieved the perfection that all others dream of, war, crime, illness. They are but dimly remembered memories. We have achieved all. No goals remain. And yet, man was meant to strive, to struggle, to yearn. Those who, to whom no distant horizons beckon, for whom no challenges remain. Though they inherited a universe, they possess only empty sand. But I will not suffer such a fate. I will not spend a lifetime in idleness in shallow pursuit of endless pleasure. Though we have achieved nirvana, it was gained for us by, by those who came before. We have not earned it, therefore it is not truly ours. My people have lost the spirit of high adventure, the thrill of exploration, the longing to, to see beyond the veil of knowledge. Even the use of our once proud limbs affords us no pleasure, for so simple a feat as walking became unnecessary in this age of mobile conveyor belt streets. But all who dwelt within this world of ceaseless pleasure seem happy with their lot. Why, then, am I so troubled? Why is there no peace, no contentment, in the breasts of Nor and Rad? If only I could have lived in the days of yore, when our race was still young and a, our galaxy a borning. I approach the Museum of Antiquity, where the last remaining weapon of warfare may still be seen. Something draws me to it. Like a magnet, I shall enter and view its wonders. Set the mental transportation element to the dawn of time, when Zen La was still untamed. It shall so be done. Now will I witness the times that tried men's souls. This is the ultimate beginning, exactly how it began on so many planets, in so many countless worlds, only to be followed eons later by the ten thousand century age of warfare which left battle scars so deep that we renounced the use of arms forever. And then at last the golden age of reason, the hundred centuries which brought learning and wisdom and peace to our war-ravaged galaxy. More! I must see more! Only by studying the past will I learn why the present is to me so totally unendurable. Attendant! I desire to study the early days of Zen Law, space travel. Instantaneously, the museum's mental transportation element gives the e eager Norn Rad a total sensation of actually being present at the launching of one of Zen Law's mighty starships ages ago, during the long extinct days of the planet's early space program. This was the time of my people's greatest glory, the time we dared to reach for the distant stars and galaxies. An entire universe was beckoning to us, and we had the courage, we had the will, to probe the vastness of the distant unknown. Our greatest heroes were the fearless, space-spanning astronauts, the time-honored astro-pioneers, to whom no journey was too far, no world was too forbidding. But then one day, it ended. We had probed the cosmos, set our flag upon a thousand galaxies. We had gone too far, seen too much, and then we no longer cared. We of Zen La, who had scattered our sea to the most distant stars, returned to our mother world, never to venture forth again. 
for us the age of space travelers died, never to be born again. Closing time, citizen. The session has ended. All is ended. Nothing remains, save stark and bleak decay. And now I stand upon another world, far younger, far more primitive, a world at the crossroads, and no man may predict which path it will elect to follow. But wait, I hear the sound of muffled footpads approaching. Yetis, the wild, savage snow-drill dwellers, the so-called abominable snowmen of earthly legend. They think me as an enemy. They rush to attack, without question or pause. Even they, poor, unthinking creatures of the frozen wastes, have been so hounded, so ruthlessly hunted for time, without measure, that they fear any who invade their desolate domain. And like so many who attack without reason, how often is blind, unreasoning unre fear the cause rather than naked savagery? They seek to smash me to the ground, to fell me by sheer weight of numbers, and I have not the words to turn aside their wrath. Since I do not wish harm to them, I shall try another means. Let my surfboard float, and thus attract their bestial attention. Seconds later, two huge clushing hands seize the strangely alien object. It is done. They have forgotten me. Now, as they battle for their prize, like the brutes they are, let my board and me again become as one, for I must leave this place of madness. And yet where can I go? The celestial currents of space are forevermore denied me, and all earth, all, on, on, all of earth there is no haven, no shelter for the likes of me. Each and every earthling in his own tragic way is as much as a yeti as those who fight below. Only the outward trappings differ, but all their hearts are filled with fear and dark distrust. Even those who I befriend, befriended, befriended have turned against me. One there was, there was men called him Hulk, the dazed and tortured titan for whom I felt deep kinship. So this is a dramatically depicted in Tales to Astonish, number 93, semi-classical stand. Look, that guy's on a flying surfboard. He's helping the Hulk escape. Though others called him a monster, to me he was a fellow being, in need of aid. I wished only to bring him to a place of safety. I wished only to call him friend. But once again I failed. He who had been so tormented now turned through a fateful misunderstanding, upon his benefactor. Stay back! I mean you no harm. Nobody harms the Hulk! Sadly, I realized he would not heed an appeal to reason. There was only one course open to me, for I am forced to resort to a mild cosmic bolt. There were others, many others. Never shall I forget the one called Dr. Doom. I, I read the one... I read the one where Dr. Doom and uh, Silver Surfer crossed over. I read that one. Unsuspectingly, I approached his lonely castle. So as we rabid readers of Fantastic Four, number 57 shall never forget Soulful Stan. He made me welcome within the cold gray walls that housed his court. I told him from whence I had come, as he listened in stony silence. Though my power beggars mere description... Still am I a prisoner upon this savage world. How could I have known that the brooding monarch, in whom I placed my trust, had but one sinister objective? Thus, while I gazed upon the distant beckoning stars, he struck, without mercy, without hesitation, stripping me of my cosmic sky-spawned powers. Even as I fell to the dank stone floor, even as Dr. Doom vowed to conquer, all mankind with the power he had stolen from me. I vowed never again to trust another human. I knew at last there was no refuge at earth, on earth, for the silver surfer. But I preserved, persevered, and in the end it was the armored arch fiend who tasted grim defeat. And so I ride the eternal winds once more, and none shall ever be my master. But what is that? half hidden in the frozen wastes below, an ancient entrance, blocked by the thousand-year weight of an ever-crumbling ever hillside. 
but an entrance to what? Zzz. A monstrous cavern which has not felt tread of human feet since time immemorial. And yet, what is that ahead of me? No simple natural cave is this. What fantastic relic of a bygone age have I stumbled on to? Here amongst these ruins once rose a city, pos prosperous and proud. Now all that remains is crumbling rubble and the dismal sight of slow decay. On earth, as in every corner of this endless universe, civilizations grow, enjoy their brief moment of glory, only to sink into the dust once more. Is this the final fate of all who live? Is this the end of striving and of hope? Is it but in desolation that man can find the peace he seeks? Was it for this I have renounced my heritage? Will my nightmare never end? Must the vision of Zen La ever return to haunt me? And Shala Baal, the lovely, faithful Shala Baal, ever here amongst the ruins I see her lovely, tear-stained face, as though it were only yesterday. I seem to hear her voice, gentle as the mist at dawning, at that tragic, fateful day. Your heart is still troubled, Norinrad. It is nothing, Shala, merely a mood that shall soon pass. I am not deceived, my love. Too long have I sensed the hunger gnawing at your beast, a hunger from, for that which I can never give you, for the prize you crave can nowhere be found, lest your journey be on the farthest, farthest star. But what can it be that you seek? There is no treasure in all the universe which cannot be found here, in an ageless Zen La. Look about you, Norinrad. See the wonders of this world of worlds. See the glories which are ours merely for the taking. No, Shala, no. That which is mine for the taking is not worth the taking. Paradise unearned is but a land of shadows. I can no longer bear the sight of my fellow man spending his days in pursuit of endless pleasure. Even our knowledge is unearned. A lifetime's learning is absorbed in minutes by our hypno-powered study cubes. And we need not want for nothing so long as we can create any substance via an inexpensive cyber-no-materializer. But mockery of mock all mockeries is our parliament. Hour after hour, the most learned of all the statesmen de debate with great solemnity, though their babble is meaningless, since we are governed by computers. But mine is a lost and lonely voice, and there are none to listen. It was at that very moment, a moment destined to change the course of a billion lives, that the fateful interruption occurred. Can you never be content? Must you always... Norin! Be silent, Shala. The citizen's alarm has sounded, for the first time in a millennium. Free men of Zen La, attend you my words. A gigantic alien spacecraft has entered our galaxy, piercing all nuclear defenses, as though they are non-existent. All citizens must be prepared for a possible invasion. No, it cannot be. We have no space fleet, no weapons. We have been at peace for ages. We have forgotten how to fight. A well-trained enemy could destroy us all. Never. We may be underprepared. But if we are people united, we cannot be conquered. Perhaps the taste of danger is what we need to make us the men our forefathers were. And even as the startled citizenry of Zen La observed the fearsome, fateful, speeding globe, Somehow I sense my moment of destiny. I seem to feel that the fate of Norn Rad is inexorably linked with the unknown invader from space. Within seconds, panic filled the streets as a gigantic planet, girdling globe, spun closer and closer. There is no place to flee! It will destroy us all! Only our computers can provide the answer. They have been fed the data. What do they say now? Never have we been faced with such seemingly limitless power. Even our infallible computers can give us no hope, no certain defense. But then, as the mysterious, rapidly descending ship seems to blot out the very heavens themselves, the computers have finally rendered a decision. Against such power absolute, we can employ nothing save the Weapon Supreme. The Weapon Supreme? It is almost unthinkable. Never before has it been deployed. For its cobalt energy is so destructive, 
that we may even suffer from its effects. And yet we have no choice. The computer must be obeyed. Employ the su weapon supreme! Then at the press of a button the deed was done. Never who, who lived during that momentous day can ever forget what next ensued. It was like a universe in chaos, as neighboring planetoids themselves were instantly hurled from orbit. And though the, our ages-old force field spent, spared Zen La from such a deadly fate, within a matter of seconds we reaped the harvest of smashing, shattering planet-wide destruction. In one fell swoop, our homes, our land, our world as we knew it, had been reduced to smoldering rubble. But at least we lived. The globe has been destroyed, but what a terrible price we have paid for our desperate deed. And all this smoke and haze... How can we be sure that the globe is truly gone? But then, finding a telescope, which was still in operable condition, we were soon to learn... Or, then finding a telescope, which was soon still in operable condition, we were soon to learn the worst. There is no longer any trace of the hostile spacecraft. Our weapon is certainly... Wait! Emerging from the very mists of nowhere, a hardening globe takes shape. It cannot be... And yet there is no doubt. Our foe has taken instant refuge in the fourth dimension and now appears again. It was all in vain. We devastated a world. And still he lives. Still he attacks. What manner of being can he be? What is the power of, of him who can traverse the dimensions as effortlessly as he spans the galaxies? Our supreme weapon is no more. Our planet lies in ruins. And still the unknown Fufo endures. Truly this was Zen Law's darkest hour. Now stand we weaponless, without defense, without hope. We who had thought ourselves the mightiest among the mightiest, must now await our fate, must now await the coming of our conqueror. There in the brief moment of eternity, a people have forgotten fear, who had forgotten want, who had thought themselves supreme, gave way to panic, oh, there, in the brief moment of eternity, a people who had forgotten fear, who had forgotten want, who had thought themselves supreme, gave way to panic and dark despair. It is the end of the world! Nothing can save us now! We are doomed! It is over forever! Don't do not fight the invader! Welcome him! Perhaps he will prove merciful! It cannot end this way! In all the world is there none to help us? But moments after the debacle... Have I been asleep, Nornrad? Am I merely awakening from a savage, incomprehensible nightmare? Not so, Shalabal. Our fear, worst fears have been realized. Zen La totters on the brink of destruction. You were but stunned by the falling debris. How could have it happened? Brief moments ago we wanted for nothing. Our world was secure, but now... But all we can do is helplessly await our final seconds. No! We still have our lives. Our unconquerable spirit, we must fight, as our ancestors would have done. No, wait, no one can fight the impossible. Nothing is impossible, except the one who has lost the will, and no one rad shall never lose his will. I must find those who will join me, those who will close ranks to make a final stand, for we must now be true to the proud heritage of Zen La. But there were none to be found, none save the injured. Excuse me and the ailing, and the weak, and the timid. Like one bereft of reason, I combed the shattered streets, desperately seeking an ally, a weapon, anything for which to fight, fight back. The globe comes ever closer, and there are none to give it pause. Help me, help me, please. I know you. You're one of the Council of Scientists. What does that matter now? What does anything matter now? There is nothing left for us, save death. But what? But we know not who attacks us, not for what motive. If I could re but reach the giant globe, if I had a spacecraft to carry me aloft. But our finest scientific minds, our greatest computers have all agreed. Our plight is hopeless. Do you hear? Hopeless. Only one who has abandoned face, faith. Since all are agreed there is no hope, then surely we have not to lose. Therefore I ask you, build me a spaceship. For I would seek the invader. Alone and unaided, you would dare approach the globe? 
I would. Then you shall have your ship. Quickly summoning others, the elderly scholar soon gathered the necessary material. You have served me well. Now stand aside, it is I alone who must complete the task. Turn your head away, Norin Rad, lest the energy of this mental constructor cause you injury. Within seconds the image of your ship, which I have in my mind, shall take solid form before our eyes. It is done. You have your spacecraft completely fu fueled. And now, though it is certain you fly before but your doom, I salute you, Norinrad. Your words may be true, but rather let me fail than never had to have tried at it at all. Ages ago, a thousand times a thousand would have begged to fly that ship, but now it is only Norinrad. The vessel I approach is far larger than I could have ever dreamed. Now I must attempt to establish contact. Unknown stranger, heed the words of Norin Rad. I speak for Zen La. You must come no closer, unless you come in peace. I was met with silence. I was met with silence. A silence so thick, so heavy, it seemed to cover the heavens like a shroud. But then, suddenly, unexpectedly, something draws me within the globe. A power so great, resistance is all but unthinkable. Then, when I left my own tiny craft, there is no crew, no sign of an invading army. But something draws me towards those lights, as a moth is drawn to flame. They grow brighter, brighter. The glare is unbearable, intolerable. I'm in the force of a, f in the grip of a force so all-consuming, so totally alien that ah. Right. Yeah, sorry about the dogs barking in the back. That's my neighbors. I'm very sorry about that. But Rise, puny creature. Rise and face the monumental ma majesty of Galactus. Do not attempt to speak. It will serve no purpose, since I know why you have come. But your quest is in vain. You cannot save your world from being ravaged by Galactus. I seek no wealth, no personal gain, no petty paltry treasure which Zen La may possess. Instead, I crave the total energy of your hapless world, energy without which Galactus cannot survive. Galactus, he whose name is legend throughout a thousand star clusters. Galactus, he whose race was old beyond time, before our galaxy existed. Galactus, the merciless planet destroyer. Rather a hundred invading armadas than the menace of Galactus. No! If you drain our energy, you drain our lives. You dare not slay an entire race. I have no wish to harm any who exist, but think that you of this. Sorry about that, so... I have no wish to harm any who exist, but think you this. If your own life depended upon stepping on an anthill, you would not hesitate. In order to live, Galactus must have energy, energy which only a healthy planet can provide. If some must fall, so that Galactus may endure, it is lamentable. But since time immemorial, is it not always the ants who fall? But there are other planets, other worlds, where no intelligent life exists. Find a world such as that. Do with it what you will. For even ants have a right to life. Alas, I cannot comply. I have not the time to seek such worlds. Had I a herald to probe the universe for me, then many worlds such as this would I spare. But there is such, no such a one. So I must make preparations. For the world of Zen La is rich in basic energy, and the hunger which I feel grows ever stronger. No, you mustn't, you can't. Stop, I beg you to hear me out. I have an offer to make. If a herald you desire, then a herald shall I be. Let me probe the heavens, scan the starways, roam the endless cosmos for you. All this will do, if you but spare my people, spare Zen La. Think, Norn Rad. Consider well what you have offered. He who assumes the mantle of the Herald to Galactus shall do so forevermore. 
such be my destiny. Willingly do I accept it. My fate is of little consequence. If it can save the world that gave me birth, mighty Galactus, do but spare Zenla, and I am ever yours to command. Your words, your words have spoke. The die is cast. So shall it be. You who have been known rad shall be so never more. Herald, prepare yourself. Prepare to be reborn. At the command of Galactus, you have fallen. And now at my command once again, I bid you rise. Your body has been completely encased in a life-preserving silvery substance of my own creation, of substance which shall shield you from heat, from cold, and from lack of oxygen. From this moment forth, neither the frigid marrow chilling emptiness of airless space nor the all-consuming inferno of the hottest sun can cause you harm. And now, to teleport you through the endless cosmos, I shall provide the perfect vehicle, an indestructible flying board, yours to control, with but a single thought. Now and forevermore, you are my herald. Now and forevermore, you are truly the Silver Surfer. Go, then, for the, your limitless reaches of space are yours. Go, and find me a world to assuage my gnawing hunger. This is what I dreamed of. This is what I have ever longed for. A lifetime of endless adventure beckoning before me. There must be no regrets, no thoughts of turning back. Worlds without limit must now await my coming, and I shall be true to my trust. For as long as I live, though before I begin the longest journey any mortal has ever known, there is one to whom I bid must bid farewell. Even in my heart will there be a longing for the lovely Shalala Baal. Do not be alarmed. I was him who was, nor in Rad. Then, then it's true. You reached the flying globe. But what happened? What have they done to you? My fate is of little, little consequence. Suffice it to say, this pair of planet shall not perish. He who commands the globe will soon depart, and Zenala will rise again. But let not the spirit of our ancestors be lost a second time. Let not our people grow soft and indolent. You sound as though you will no longer be among us. That is so, Shalabal. Never shall we meet again. Such is the price I must pay that a world may live. While infinity beckons, I must leave behind my very heart. Never has there be, never will there be, another such as you. If leave you must, then let us depart together. Take me with you, Norn Red, for without you there is nothing. Say no more. It cannot be. It can never be. Where soars the silver surfer? There must he soar, Alone. Well, do I remember those early days, where only endless journeys could cease the bitter ache within my breast. And every star, and every sun, I see her face. But with the passing of time, the pain was eased, for there were worlds to save. I cannot summon Galactus here when life abounds, though they be simple, aimless creatures. They think, they breathe, they feel. Thus they must not perish from this land. Ever onward did I soar, till time itself has lost its meaning. I have seen the birth of planets and the death of worlds. I have seen galaxies crumble and new suns aborning. But never have I glimpsed the answer to the riddle of the universe. Then the most fateful moment of all, the discovery of planet Earth. At last... A world to nourish my master. But there is life below, and yet Galactus has journeyed far, and his hunger knows no bounds. It was here, upon this tortured world, that I first defied him who had given me my power, 
for those who dwelled upon the earth had a special sort of glory, as did Fantastic Four number 50, from whence the Sterling sequence had been taken. Historical stand. So that, was in, that was in the Galactus saga. Stand back, Herald. These creatures are of no consequence to Galactus. No, Master, no! You cannot destroy the entire human race. They are as deserving of life as you or I. Never before had I dared to challenge Galactus, and so it began. I f no matter what my fate, I face it without qualm, for I have learned from the humans how glorious it can be to have a cause worth dying for. Of all who lived, I have cherished you the most, but now by my hand the Silver Surfer must perish. No, Galactus, it is you who will perish, for we have found the weapon at last. The ultimate nullifier in the hands of a human. You hold the means to destroy a galaxy, to lay waste to a universe. If you have missed FF number 50, you'll have to take our word for all this. It's too involved to explain right here. Squeamish Stan. For the first time since the pawn of memory, my will has been thwarted. But I bear no malice. Emotion is for lesser beings. There, yet there is one thing that must be done. Since you are no longer to, herald, to be herald to Galactus, no longer, I remove your space-time powers. Henceforth the Silver Surfer shall roam the galaxies no more. Now here I stand, alone and forsaken upon this hostile world, I who have crested the waves of infinity, exiled forever upon this lonely sphere. But time is long and fate is fickle. My destiny still lies before me. And where it beckons, there shall soar the Silver Surfer. Next issue, in Lance the Saucer. And now there's a Watcher story. So now the most dazzling, daringly dramatic co-feature of all. The Wonder of the Watcher. With but a single gesture I could save the fading life below. But I dare not interlude, intrude. I am forbidden to act. His pulse is almost gone. We're losing him. We're only human. We haven't the knowledge nor the skill to save him. It's over. There's no more heartbeat. A Marvel cameo classic recreated by Stanley and Gene Colan, embellished by Sid Shores, lettered by Artie Simic. The first of a fantastic new series. I cannot shake the feeling that we were not alone. Here, the, the feeling that somehow someone else was watching. I wonder, how many lives have been lost because we knew so little? How many might have been saved? If more of the secrets of the universe might have been revealed to us. But man must struggle on alone, slowly gaining scraps of knowledge bit by bit. Poor, weak, fumbling mortals, that desire so much, yet know so little. But frail and fallible as they may be, within their souls lie the seeds of greatness. Of all who live within the vast, unending cosmos, none do I pity more than they. None are more in need of aid. Aid which must be denied to them, forever. Though my knowledge is virtually without peer, though my power is unsurpassed by any mortal being, I too have my limitations. I too have my known, have known my fa failures, have tasted my defeats. This is why the Watcher must remain ever aloof, sentenced to observe the unfolding of time's grim tableau, to record the ever-changing chronicle of living history. Yes. Only a watcher shall I ever be. Such is my fate. Such was my folly. How well I remember the fateful beginning. The glory of the galaxy which spawned my race. While the Milky Way itself was still a morning. Our world was ancient. Its origins forever lost beneath the shifting sands of time. Though as though we possessed knowledge beyond measure. Treasures beyond description. We lacked the blessing of contentment. Beyond the furthest reaches of our galaxy are other worlds and other cultures. How can we ever rest until we have found them all? Even as we bathed in our life-giving delta rays, we spoke of nothing else. We could be bringing, be like gods, bringing the gifts of health and wealth to other races. And throughout the universe, all who lived to pay our, would pay homage to our names. Even now the words of my father, most honored member of the High Tribunal, still ring like thunder in my ears. 
Tis our duty, tis our duty to aid lesser races. Nay, I call, we owe nothing to those who are not our equals. It was then that I mouthed the fateful words which swayed the tribunal. You are wrong, Imnu. The strong must always and the aid the weak, else our strength is but a sham. You are outvoted, Imnu. Let us absorb the cosmic antimatter isotopes which will enable us to travel through the void of space via thought alone. Where there is darkness, we shall bring light. Where there is turmoil, we shall bring peace. Never shall our voyage be forgotten. But if our motive is not but glory... No matter. Our names will be venerated by th till the end of time. The moment is here. Behold, our bodies begin to change. We are transformed to living energy. In this form, we are free to travel with the speed of thought. No destination is beyond our reach. And so the journey began, a journey which ended upon the primitive planet of Priscilius, a thousand worlds away, a journey whose awesome result none could then foresee. Before us stand the Priscillians. Little do they suspect the wonders that we bring them. Before our eyes, strange beings appearing out of nowhere. Be not alarmed. We come to you as friends. We wish to aid you to enrich your lives. We brought you a gift such as you have never known. The gift of unlimited energy. It will advance your civilization by a thousand years. You must tell us more. Once we have taught you to harness nuclear power, it will serve your every need. It will aid you to cure disease, to develop heavy industry, and to reach the stars. But you are strain but you are strangers. Why do you you wish to do this for us? We have no selfish motives. We merely wish to share share the fortune we possess for those who are have less than we. Our offer was eagerly accepted, and then a short time later You have taught us all you can. All that remains is for us to build a cyclotron. This is a great moment for Priscillus. They have learned quickly and well. How grateful they are. That will prove to Emnu that we were right. Let us hope so, my son. But Emnu still dissented. We are not gods. We have no business interfering with other races. But think of the progress we bring them. What does it matter? They are no concern of ours. Now let us depart. The sooner this mission of madness is ended, the more to my liking it will be. Then we shall transform ourselves once more. But though we left Priscillus, our next destination was even further from the world which gave us birth. Before returning home, let us sample the wonders of this distant star cluster. There is much to behold, and time has no meaning here. And, as we toured the limitless cosmos, the Priscillians prospered, reaping the benefits of a new and rewarding nuclear age. But there was one for whom progress had no meaning. Let others use the atom for the good of their fellow beings. In my hands it means power absolute. I will build weapons of war, such as none had ever dared imagine. However, he was not alone in his brutal ambition. We are strikes, our foes without mercy. The nuclear warheads are now installed. Let the launch begin. Soon, a world which had lived in peace for countless centuries became a battleground. A battleground for one of the most devastating atomic wars of all time. Death to all who oppose us! Then, not content with the carnage caused upon his own hapless planet, the Priscillians turned their rocket launchers skyward in a seemingly mad orgy of senseless wanton destruction. Now that the power is ours, we must destroy the worlds that neighbor us before they can make us their target. Yes, we had given them power they who had not the moral capacity to comprehend its worth. And even as the unthinking Priscillians launched their fateful attack, Missiles approaching from Priscillian sector? How is it possible? They were centuries from the development of atomic power, and now it is too late to stop them. Thus, without warning, the deed was done. We who had tried to bring the blessings of science to a primitive world had brought it instead to this. The Priscillians have struck first, but the touch of a button will bring instant retaliation. Though we ourselves have been crushed, Priscillus too shall share our fate. And so ensued the final nuclear holocaust, 
a needless senseless time of carnage which left its terrible toll upon two stricken worlds. In a matter of minutes, the slow progress of untold centuries had been completely wiped out. It was not till later, on our journey homeward, that we saw, Vesilius, a world in flames! It cannot be! What could have happened? Due to the lingering radioactivity, it was many months before we could safely descend. But then at last, no trace of civilization, nothing but carnage and rubble. I hear a voice from beyond the, the, the rocks. You are to blame. You did this to us. We would be living, still living in peace had you not brought us your deadly secret of atomic energy before we were ready for it. Yea, you and your race be cursed to the end of your days. May the spirits of space have mercy. What have we done? We had no right to tamper with the destiny of others. We cannot undone, undo what has been done. But so long as memory endures, we do solemnly vow it will never occur again. And so throughout the countless eons, we have but not but have been a wandering race of untiring watchers. Thus has it ever been, thus shall it ever be. Beginning anew, next issue, Tales of the Watcher. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. If you could like, comment, and subscribe, that'd be appreciated. Sorry for all the noise, some of the noise in the background. Very sorry about that, but... Um, yeah, so, sorry about that, but uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy the video, and I'll see you guys later.